Hello, if you're watching this, you found Pro Wrestling Reviews, the YouTube channel. If you're listening to this, you found us on SoundCloud. Today, we're going to be reviewing the March 11th episode of AEW Dynamite, which was at First Bank Center, Denver, Colorado. The viewership was 766,000. Now, this is down by uh, 99,000 from the previous week in the Silverstein's Eye Center. Uh, but uh, which is in, I believe, Salt Lake. But from then to uh, this current review, what caused that 99 or 100,000 uh, person drop in viewership is, of course, the coronavirus and all the coverage with that. So uh, the viewership performance on this episode is not indicative of its quality. I would not say that at all. Um, not for the most part. But we're going to get right into this. Uh, we're going to start with the first match. Uh, that was at the First Bank Center for Denver, Colorado, March uh, 4th episode of AEW Dynamite. It was uh, starting off with Cody Rhodes coming down to the ring, and he cut a promo, and he basically said, I'm going to stand here right in the middle of the ring, and MJF's going to come down, look me square in the eye, and tell me he beat me fair and square. Now, I don't know if he's going to persist with that or not, but if he does, then he has to put in a window here where if he gets a rematch, it's going to have to be him getting his challenge rights for the world title back if he wins. Uh, that seems to be the only angle that makes sense to me for him to go after MJF at this point. Uh, there would have to be something for him to gain out of it. Revenge wouldn't be enough at this point. There would have to be more than just that for this feud to continue. And it should continue. Cody Rhodes saying he'll never challenge for the world title again is just the stupidest, stupidest decision I've ever seen in, in all of wrestling ever. It's, it's, he's 30, 30 years old. He's stupid. And of course, he's fucking around with Dustin, in my opinion. I talked about that in the last episode. But anyway, getting back to the point, uh, he cut a promo, and then uh, about a minute and a half, and then Jake the Snake Roberts came down, and man, oh man, did Jake cut a promo that would make you... There was, an, like, the whole promo was gold. I can think of three parts right now that I loved, and I'm not even going to try to mimic his voice, okay? I suck at mimicking voices. But he said... Uh, about his client it'll be like a phoenix rising from the ashes soaring to the sun you know what i mean it and he gave you that visualization of it and then uh and another point uh he said um it's been 20 years for me cody 20 years to get clean to get right but by god i've earned it and at first, I didn't really know what that meant. And then I thought maybe that meant that he's saying, I deserve to be here. I deserve to be in the big leagues. I deserve to be in front of the cameras. I've paid my dues for the shit I've done. And I bet you that's a big part of it for sure. But another part of it is saying that I'm not leaving. I'm not going anywhere. Like, which he pretty much verified my suspicion, my guess on what he meant when he said right after that, if you expect me to be a good boy and play by the rules, you got another thing coming. <laughs> My man, you got another thing coming, is what he said. But anyway, that was a really, really great uh, promo. Uh, I mean, if uh, Cody Rhodes' Silver Spoon uh, promo last year that Cody Rhodes cut uh, before going into a full gear pay-per-view at uh, the Wintrust Arena in Chicago City Limits proper, like the Silver Spoon is what Cody Rhodes cut for the AW uh, full gear pay-per-view last year, if that Silver Spoon promo won Promo of the Year, which it did, I believe it was on Pro Wrestling uh, Illustrated, or it might have been Wrestling Observer. I'm pretty sure it was Pro Wrestling Illustrated. But either way, it won Promo of the Year. Now, if that won Promo of the Year, then com then comparing Jake to Snake Roberts' promo to that, Jake Snake Roberts' promo should hands down win Promo of the Year. Like, there's no way that was not like 10 out of 10. Like, that's like 11 out of 10, totally. But anyway, and then after that, he left. And then we got into uh, the first match, SCU and Colt Cabana versus the Dark Order. You know what, man? I got to be honest. I, I, I Six-man tags, eight-man tags, handicap matches, women's tags. I don't do a full review of them because those formats of matches, they don't have championships. They don't have actual divisions. Uh, it's just a waste of a match, in my opinion. It shouldn't count. It shouldn't. 
It goes to your overall record, which in my opinion shouldn't affect anything. But whatever. I will give a quick breakdown of the first match, which was SU and Colt Cabana uh, versus the Dark Order. Uh, what I will say about it is that it, it, even though there was eight men, it made sense. Like, I, pr almost for the whole match, I had no problems telling on who the legal man was and who wasn't. And, and uh, Colt Cabana has very, <laughs> very comical, but yet very effective style of wrestling. It, it's quite enjoyable to watch, actually. Um, I remember recently uh, Ortiz started doing this thing where he kind of does that and then he just lands on you like a board and his, only his head is touched like on your stomach and then he basically tries to pin you that way that kind of reminds me of Colt Cabana's uh, style now if those two are like trained together I don't know but uh, that was the he was the highlight of the match of course uh, SCU and Colt Cabana well they won and then after that uh, Evil Uno uh, when he's up on the ramp with the rest of the Dark Ori he said the, the Exalted One's gonna be furious like yeah so uh, that was uh, that was pretty entertaining there, and then actually the Cody Rhodes promo that I just talked about happened after SCU and Cole Cabana versus the Dark Order, which we just reviewed. Before that match, it was the John Moxley uh, promo. Uh, one thing I will say about this, it wasn't terribly different from his other promos. It was still basically that headstrong, pissed off, fight my way through, fuck everybody type of uh, mentality, right? Kind of, kind of like a one-dimensional character, really, but... At least with this promo, he went a little bit of a step further and he's trying to show people like, this is not a character, this is who I really am. And I think there is a big distinction between those two things, between portraying a character and then and then being yourself and yet who you are is so uh, entertaining, which some people are, that you can be, you can sell as a character just who you are, right? And I think that that's what John Moxley's trying to do. He's trying to sell himself as a character rather than trying to sell his character, if that makes any sense. Um, but there, there was two parts in that promo I really liked. He looked straight at the camera. He said, we brought pro wrestling back. And I know for a fact he was talking to Vince McMahon. Nobody on the face of this planet can tell me that that wasn't directed straight at the center of Vince McMahon's heart. Oh, yeah. And there was another p uh, part in the promo. Now, this might not be the three things he said in a row. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong uh, on the YouTube video. But uh, there was one point where he said, you can get knocked out, you can get submitted, you can get pinned. It's all the same to me. That was awesome. That should be... That should be on a t-shirt. That should definitely be on a t-shirt. He should, like, I have to do a design and try to, like, show that to AEW, man, because that should be a slogan or or, or his catchphrase or something, because uh, I think right now it's unscripted violence, but, I mean, he could at least make a t-shirt with that phrase, but it, w it was pretty cool. Then, of course, the dark, uh, the, the inner circle came out, and they were, like, me, 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 to uh, John Moxley, and basically John Moxley said, I'll kick all your asses. So, that was the opening promo uh, with John Moxley and then in versus the Inner Circle. Then we reviewed SCU and Coco Bana versus the Dark Order, uh, which, you know, was an organized match. Coco Bana was funny. Dark Order lost. Exalted One's going to be furious. Then we talked about the Cody Rhodes uh, promo, which happened after that match, where he ch told MJF to come out and admit he beat him fair and square. And then, of course, Jake came out instead. And then cut, like, in my opinion, the best promo I've ever seen in my life. One of the best promos I've ever seen in my life, period. Uh, the only other promo I would say that's better than Jake Snake Roberts is one that I saw with, uh, with um, uh, what's his, John Cena uh, cut when he was in the ring against Vince McMahon. Uh, I, I can't remember when or anything, but uh, uh, I remember John Cena saying, so go ahead, fire me, you know, or send me home without pay and lock me down. That's what, that's what you're known for. That's what you do. And uh, he said, I'll just, or, or you can be a man of some worth, something like that. He said, I'll just go to another show, brother, indicating Impact Wrestling, or then TNA. And then Triple H came out and then told Vince McMahon that he was ousted from power. And of course, they both started crying a bit. That was an excellent promo. Uh, uh, Jake Snake Roberts was equally as good as that, equally as good as anything the WWE's ever done. 
And of course, that was the second promo that happened after the first match. Now, anyway, the second match that happened was Big Swole versus Leva Bates. Now, I will read to you the the notable lists done by each wrestler. I'll read a short summary, and then we'll talk about the match. Uh, number two, Big Swole versus Leva Bates. Big Swole pulled off a gut wrench, power bomb, a diamond cutter, dirty dancing, and Leva Bates. Uh, pull the backstabber, a perfect form backstabber. And one thing I should say about that diamond cutter is that Big Swole was standing like outside the ropes, right? And then uh, Leva Bates was on the inside. And then she kind of leaped in between the top and the middle rope and then grabbed Leva Bates and diamond cuttered her. <laughs> cuttered her. Cuttered her. Uh, it, it was. I see that a lot in AEW for some reason. It seems like the guys really, the, the wrestlers really love to work with the ropes, which is. Which is which is fine, really. It doesn't really bother me. Anyway, uh, the match summary. Of all the squash matches that AEW has offered thus far, this was by far the most entertaining. Swole immediately kicked Peter Avalon off the ring apron when he tried to, uh, when he tried to start getting involved, which sold Swole as the more powerful face in the contest against Leva Bates. After hitting Swole in the face with a book, which was out of sight of the ref, Leva nailed Swole with a perfect form backstabber. Then got her clocked, knocked loose by three great offensive moves in a row before getting pinned, which gave another victory to Big Swole. Excellent. Now, I gave this match 8 out of 10, and this is now we're going to talk about it. And you're going to say, well, what the hell? There was like four moves in total, and you gave this 8 out of 10. Now, one thing I think is really important to understand is that there have been other matches I've reviewed in the past that have had more moves involved that have had a less score. But when I look at it, and even as I'm saying this now, I kind of realized what AEW is ter- talking about in terms of match quality. Yes, there was only four moves involved. Yes, it was a, clearly a squash match. But in my opinion, as far as squash matches go, it was very good. I've seen terrible squash matches, like seven seconds. You know, Brock Lesnar coming in and beating Kofi Kingston in like seven seconds as a main event. That's complete bullshit. Um... This wasn't like that, but it clearly showed Big Swole is just the powerhouse compared to the pitiful Leva Bates in comparison to Big Swole. But that match was 8 out of 10. It was really good. I'm starting to like uh, Big Swole quite a bit. I think Big Swole's best performance was in a match she lost, but it was against uh, Nyla Rose. Uh, Nyla Rose wasn't the women's champion then, but it was a wicked, gritty, brawling style. I really liked it. But anyway, that was Big Swole versus Leva Bates. Now we're going to move on to the third match of the night, which was Pac versus Chuck Taylor. I'm going to read off the moves each wrestler did, read the summary, and then we're going to talk about the match a bit. The third match of the night was Pac versus Chuck Taylor. Pac did a headlock takeover, side headlock takeover, running shoulder block takedown, Tierras, Snapdragon, suplex outside the ring, no, sorry. A snap suplex outside the ring. It's like a vertical suplex, only you go back fast. A diamond cutter and a brutalizer. Chuck Taylor pull off a pop, like a pop up sit down power bomb. A hard Irish whip to the buckles. Man, oh man. I know Pac is a brick shit house, but holy god, that had to hurt even him. That was the hard one. One of the hardest Irish whips I've ever seen. Holy god. Oh, anyway. <coughs> Heart Irish whip to the turnbuckles. Tilt a world backbreaker, which was perfect form. A Falcon Arrow, a uh, modified pile driver from the top ropes. Now, when that modified pile driver was being done, I believe I heard Excalibur. I, I believe he called it like a waffle or something. I'm not quite sure. So, a modified pile driver. I, I give a description on what the move looks like if I just simply cannot make out what uh, the announcers are saying. Usually it's Excalibur who calls the moves of the, the names of the moves and stuff, right? Anyway, let's get into the summary, and then we'll talk about it. While Pac once again showcased why he is pound for pound arguably the best all-around wrestler in AEW, the attention grabber here was how technically efficient Chuck Taylor was. It was a slow start for Chuck's first AEW singles match as Pac ensured he ex- Spelled his pent-up aggression and eagerness on his opponent first. But Taylor battled through the onslaught and fought back with a number of his own moves that very nearly put the bastard down for the count. However, never count the bastard out. 
Pack kicked out of a devastating modified pile driver from the ropes. Roll out the way of Taylor's top rope moonsault attempt just in time. Then pounced on Chuck and locked in the brutalizer to put away the last remaining best friends member he had to face in singles competition. This outing improved a record that already had Pack sitting in the top five for the world championship, and so it's obvious how much he wanted this win. This match successfully proved important to both competitors. Now, when I say that Pack had a victory over the last remaining best friends member. What I mean is that the best friends right now have uh, Trent Beretta or Trent, Chuck Taylor, and then Orange Cassidy. Pac has already defeated Trent Beretta, uh, I, 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 I think twice. And then he uh, and then Pac also defeated Orange Cassidy. So the last remaining member of best friends for Pac to face and defeat to, uh, would be Chuck Taylor, which he did. And uh, when I say this match was very important to both competitors, it really was for Pac, obvious reasons. Two reasons, actually. Number one, he wanted to win to, because Pac is all about wins, it's all about legitimacy, all about winning world titles, the way a friggin' wrestler should be. You know, if you're not in it to win the title, then you're just fucking around, in my opinion. Um, but the other part of it is that all of Pac's matches have been back and forth, back and forth. I do not remember an extended period of time. Now, I could be wrong, but off the top of my head, I cannot remember an extended period of time in a match, like for an extended period of time, where he was just getting his ass kicked and survived all of it. So the previous matches showed his grit and his strength and his power and his, ag- and his agility and pretty much everything. But it didn't show his endurance in a manner where it can hold up to a continuous onslaught. I think this was the first match we saw where we saw how Pac's endurance could hold up to continuous onslaught. You know what I mean? And uh, for some weird reason in my mind, that was an important distinction. So I just want to mention that. Uh, it was also important for Chuck Taylor because um, Jim Cornette had mentioned once, I believe, that uh, I could. I remember him saying that Trent Beretta is the only uh, good member of the best friends. And... Um, that may be based on a lot of fact. I mean, Jim Cornette knows his stuff without any question. But I would, and I would urge him to watch this match, because if you watch this match and then come back and tell me that Chuck didn't go a long way in proving that he is capable of a good wrestling match, if you don't admit that after watching this, then you're just being a blind idiot. Oh yeah, Dr Pepper. Not sponsored, not endorsed. I just love Dr. Pepper. <laughs> so anyway, this match was a 9 out of 10. Definitely 9 out of 10. I tend to only give 10 out of 10s to matches that have pretty much all of what I just listed and uh, at least two submissions in it, right? But that was definitely 9 out of 10 for sure. The fourth match that happened... For the March 4th episode of AEW Dynamite at First Bank Center in Denver, Colorado, was Jake Hager versus QT Marshall. Moves, summary, and then we're going to talk about it a bit. Number four, Jake Hager versus QT Marshall. Jake Hager pull off a uh, lackluster belly to back suplex, uh, half ass power slam. A DDT counter toss, which means that when uh, QT Marshall hooked his arm around uh, Jake Hager's head and then like swung around to do a tilt the world DDT, when his body was like in front of Jake Hager, Jake Hager simply used his power to throw Marshall forward. So he basically tossed him, and Marshall land on his uh, on his forearms and his belly, which would hurt. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, DDT counter toss by Jake Hager. Hager also did a very hard lariat that turned Marshall inside out, flipping and everything. And then he did his boring-ass standing triangle, tri- standing arm triangle choke. Now, somebody may say, oh, well, it's boring, but it works. It's a real MMA thing. I it pro- I know, apparently it is. It is. I'm not debating that. But this is pro wrestling. It has to catch attention. I'm not saying flip over the friggin' ropes like a lot of these idiots do. I'm sick of that shit. One thing I like about the revival that they the copyright is no flips, just fists. I fucking love that. I'm sick of this stupid high flying shit. But you have to have at least a little bit of intrigue in your submission. He just stands up and wraps his arms around your your neck, and then you basically pretend you're passing out. It's the dumbest finisher. 
It's the second dumbest finisher I've ever seen in my entire life. Roman Reigns' Super Punch is the stupidest finisher I've ever seen. Superman Punch. I do not give a shit if that's a real MMA move. It look that's a fucking stupid finisher for pro wrestling. Anyway, I just went off on the standing triangle there. Anyway, for QT Marshall, uh, <coughs> he pulled off standing drop kick enzigiri, or what I like to call scissors kick. Uh, uh, Marclosa. That's the best thing I can understand. What uh, Excalibur said was a Marclosa. It almost looked like a like you're standing on the top ropes. Uh, with your back facing the guy inside in the ring on the mat, and then you kind of like do a 180, but then also flip. It's kind of like a 180 Swanton bomb almost. Uh, it looked it looks really cool. I have to say that looks awesome. And the summary of this match: surprisingly an enjoyable match to watch, as this was the Dynamite singles debut for both men, and both delivered without a doubt. It was far from a squash match for Hager, as Marshall hit a number of kicks, strikes, and a few big numbers that looked impressive, and even took Jake Hager off his feet. But yet a one count was all he could get. Jake was not about to lose his momentum coming off a win over Dustin Rhodes at Revolution, though, which was bullshit in my opinion. And certainly wasn't about to lose his Dynamite debut, so his endurance and toughness pretty much tells the story for him. He basically pushed his way through and manhandled QT around the ring to easily outlast and outpower his opponent for the win. Solid, even matchup, 7 out of 10. I mean, there was enough moves in it for me to consider it decent, but, like, a strong decent, but not enough for me to consider it, like, good or great or, or perfect or anything. Um... It didn't do much for Hager at all. I wouldn't say this match did absolutely nothing for Jake Hager. And the only thing I could say is that he wasn't trickling sweat as much as he was halfway through the match against Dustin Rhodes at the Revolution. But as far as this match goes, it, it didn't... I do not feel like he, and he did anything in this match to propel himself forward in terms of convincing people that he has a big repertoire or really good ability or natural talent for pro wrestling. It was just another win for him I didn't see anything in it that made me like holy shit he's actually really a lot better than I thought or wow he knows that move like not nothing no moments like that at all I had those moments for QT Marshall though for QT Marshall I mean that that Mark, Mark Closa or what I like to call the 180 Swanton Bomb and uh his Enzigiri was spot on I find Enzigiri looks so stupid I, I probably in real life if somebody did it to me I'd be knocked out but it looks so dumb maybe I'm just too picky about certain things but anyway, and the standing draw kick, like the three big notable moves that QT Marshall did in this match, they were done spot on perfect form. Like, so he's getting his form down really, really well. And it seems like he's going for this like higher flyer, high flying, like luchador style almost. Um, which is a shame because he would be a good sell for a heavyweight championship. I, I, I could see it. I could see it in the right time. Not right now, but... I, I could see him making a run for the world title at some point if he got the right intensity about him. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, no, 7 out of 10. Uh, Jake Hager sucked in this match. QT was this match, in my opinion. But of course, Jake Hager's being pushed because he's a big, bad powerhouse. Former WWE world champion. Undefeated in Bellator. He's only had two wins, and he won both. And then there was another no contest because of knees and the balls. But... <laughs> That's that match. Last match, uh, Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara versus Darby Allen. Okay, now I'm not going to give this a out of 10 score because there's no championship or uh, division for this format. But I will say that this match sold... Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara has heels and they're sold... <coughs> excuse me. Darby has the lovable underdog like face, like story right it was supposed to be him and John Moxley tagging to take on uh, Jericho and Guevara but the inner circle took out John Moxley prior to the match starting which is the reason why it turned out to be uh, Jericho and Guevara versus uh, Allen rather than also Allen and um, Moxley but like I said uh, Gu uh, Darby Allen played the endurance game f for a lot of this match but almost as much as he even played the endurance game he also played the offensive game which is a huge distinction in my opinion because Darby Allen, for the longest time, I mean, when I think about Fighter Fest, when I think about uh, <coughs> when I think about Fighter Fest, when I think about his match uh, against, I believe, he, yeah, he, he had a match against uh, 
I believe he had a match against Kenny Omega or Hangman Page. Can't remember which one, but it was the same thing. It was him, like, just basically getting beat up the whole time. Then he went against Chris Jericho for the world title, and he had his hands, uh, like, handcuffed or tied behind his back, and then he got the shit kicked out of him. He, he's basically a really strong punching, really tough punching bag. This match changed that, in my opinion. I mean, his match against Sammy Guevara at Revolution showed he could do more. This match took it and continued that further because it was a handicap match and he did more offense in this one match than he did in his first two matches ever in AEW put together. So yeah, this match to me was important to be on the card. It was important to be the book, book the way it was. And uh, it sold Jericho and Guevara, as, Sammy Guevara as assholes. And of course it made everybody love uh, Darby Allen even more. This was a pretty good episode, all in all. Um... All in all, I give it. Uh, I give it a. I, I give it an eight out of ten. No, I give this a seven point five out of ten. I give, I give the Dynamite March Fourth episode at First Bank Center in Denver, Colorado, seven point five out of ten. The reason why it doesn't get uh, eight or more is because they had two. Uh, the last match I can understand, but the first match, of eight man tag match, I fucking hate that. To me, that causes it to lose two and a half points right off the top. I'm sorry. I know some people don't agree with me, but that's just how I feel. But I will review the matches in terms of giving an outline of them and how it went and how it seemed. But they will not be receiving an out of ten score. I, I won't do that. It doesn't put anybody forward. It's just a waste of a match. But anyway, this is the second podcast for Pro Wrestling Reviews on SoundCloud. And if you're still seeing me on the YouTube channel, it's just another video. Thanks for saying bye.